Welcome and kia ora. I'm Diana Winand. I'm chair of the San Fernando Valley Climate Reality Chapter. We're part of the Climate Reality Project, whose mission is to catalyze a global solution to the climate crisis by making urgent action a necessity across every sector of society. We have a very special program tonight on the rights of nature, and I'll introduce our four esteemed guests in a few minutes. We just got off of screening the film, but for those of you who may have watched it a little while ago, I'm gonna just share five slides with you very quickly to just do a sort of a synopsis. Uh, filmmakers, excuse me for boiling it down to five slides, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Um, following the industrial revolution, nature was seen as an object for our use, a commodity to own and dominate, exploit it, extract resources from it, dispose waste on it. The key value is financial profit. And the result is severe damage to our environment and a threat to human health and sustainability. Indigenous people's concept is that nature is an independent entity seen as a mother or ancestor. Humans are a part of nature. They have a relationship as caretakers and protectors, kaitiaki. Key value is harmony and balance. Rights of nature applies this concept to legal systems, gives nature's rights and legal standing equal to people and restores health to the environment. Over 100 nations, including Ecuador, Bolivia, India, and New Zealand, have some form of legal rights for nature in their constitution or federal laws. New Zealand settled divergent rights of indigenous Maori um, and versus government and private interests by setting up partnerships between local indigenous groups and national parks to manage land and rivers, which are defined as owning themselves. And one of our guests tonight, uh, two of our guests tonight will be able to speak specifically uh, to how that is going. Um, Utah, Great Salt Lake, uh, a law gave it rights to get its own water as a possible solution to growing population, climate change, and you know, it's it's we, another guest is going to speak to that. So, how I invite you to give us an update on what's happening with the Great Salt Lake. Um, City of Santa Monica in 2013 passed a sustainability rights ordinance, allowing people to sue on behalf of parts of nature. 150 communities in the U.S. have enacted similar measures, and we actually have. Uh, the former city attorney, uh, Marsha Mutri, who uh, prepared the sustainability rights ordinance, she's on the call tonight. So we will include you in the conversation when we get to that point, Marsha. Thank you for joining us. The UN is considered a universal declaration for the rights of nature, but even with this recognition, implementation and enforcement are difficult due to costs for suing, already existing laws that protect property or profit, lack of buy-in by enough people, especially lawyers and judges. So that gives you a, a synopsis of what we're talking about, what the film talked about. And um, now we want to go to uh, introduce our special, special guest. Uh, I'll start with Isaac uh, Gekaritz is the co-director, co-producer, cinematographer, and editor for the documentary. And he was the first person who said yes to joining us tonight when I asked. So thank you, Isaac. I, I really appreciate your willingness to share your work. Um, and um, uh, by the way, very, very good documentary. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Hal Krimmel, core director, co-producer and writer on the film. Hal is Brady professor and chair of the Department of English at Weber State University. He teaches environmental and sustainability issues, was a former fellow at the Rachel Carson Center in Munich. Al's published multiple books on environmental topics. His latest is Utah's Air Quality Issues, Problems and Solutions. Uh, the third producer of the documentary is Maria Valerio Barros from Argentina, who you saw in the film, but she couldn't join us due to the time difference. Kirsty Luke is chief executive of the Toho Te Ura Tuamatua, Miguel Tujo's Tribal Authority. And Kirsty, please correct my, um, my pronunciation uh, as we go along in the meeting here. She's a lawyer by trade and has been a key member of the Tujo and Crown Treaty negotiations. Her goal is to build the organization and the tribe's economy, improve descendants' quality of life, and develop an economy that relies upon the bounty of the land naturally. And last in introductions, but certainly not last in the critical work documented in the film is the Honorable Christopher Finlayson, a New Zealand lawyer and former member of parliament. He was a cabinet minister, attorney general and minister for treaty of Waitangi negotiations. He was also minister of culture and heritage. 
He retired from Parliament in 2019 and joined Bankside Chambers in Auckland. We are so very happy you could all join us tonight. This film is such a good introduction to the rights of nature. Thank you for producing it and making it so accessible. I'm gonna throw out the four questions that we wanna to cover tonight. And very simply they are, we wanna know more about who you are, uh, what you did both in the film and the treaty and nature's rights how you did it, and then we want to get your advice and input on how you can uh, help us galvanize the, the movement in our area. So let's start uh, with the first one. Uh, tell us more about who you are and how you became involved in the rights of nature. And I'll, I'll just have um, Isaac and Hal as producers. Curious, how did this uh, all get started? Don't jump at one. <laughs> well, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll Wait, start. Who called who? Who called who? I mean, who had the idea and picked up the phone and said, hey? Because I think, Hal, I think you were at the Rachel Carson Center in Munich with Val. Is that correct? With the other That's producers? Right. Okay. That's right. Isaac and I had worked on some projects uh, previously. And in fact, I was working on a couple there in, in, in Germany. And we were sort of emailing back and forth, wrapping those up. And, and Val was my office mate. And her project at, at Rachel Carson involved the rights of nature and uh, something I'd never heard of. And um, the more I listened to her talk about it and uh, the more I thought, this is a really, really interesting topic, especially one that would lend itself well to a film. And I just, you know, the last 10 years, I've gotten less interested in producing academic work and wanted to do more sort of public humanities uh, work where you can get these ideas out to you know, to, to people who aren't uh, professors. <laughs> and um, so I emailed Isaac and he said, yeah, that sounds great. And so we just slowly put the pieces together and talk a little bit more about that uh, as, as we get into it. It was, it was a real adventure, but I really have to, obviously it wouldn't have been possible without Isaac, who's the filmmaking pro, and it would not have been possible without Kirsty and Chris, who were such gracious hosts. I mean, we literally got off the plane in New Zealand with like, no, <laughs> nothing lined up. <laughs> and and both Kirsty and Chris just uh, opened the door. They picked up the phone and, 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 and connected us with so many people. So thank you, uh, Kirsty and Chris, both uh, again. And, and we flew them in here to... Utah pre-COVID, pre and we did a week-long series here um, on the on the rights of nature, which is really wonderful. Isaac, do you want to add something to that? Your perspective? Um, I mean, the film you had co-producer, co-director, cinematographer, editor, so you had the film in your hands. <laughs> you basically shaped yeah, yeah. and created yeah. the outfit. So tell us, uh, tell us about that. How, you know, how wrote a lot. We were joking, actually joking the other day about how much he wrote and how much I cut out. And then, <laughs> you know, you know he, he wrote a lot. And, and then I um, kind of went through all these um, interviews. The, the tricky part of the film is half of it's in Spanish. And I, I can do Spanish, but it's environmental law Spanish is even harder than Spanish, just, just so you know. So, so that was the tricky part is, is pulling all those sound bites out. And, but, but Val, of course, spoke Spanish. You could help us subtitle those correctly. And so, um, that, but that was fun. I think that was part of it. We wanted to include these cultures. A lot of those people in Spanish could actually speak English, but we still chose to have them in Spanish to recognize the beginnings of this movement, you know. Um, but, but we really, um, as Hal said, we wanted something, a humanity type thing. We, we weren't trying to make a, something super dramatic. We really just wanted to get the information out there and tell it in a, in a way that was truthful and, and honest and things work and things don't work and there's challenges. And, and I think we're pretty happy with how it came together. I, you know, I've talked to several people um, about um, how much they liked this film, how straightforward it was, uh, how easy it was to follow, how much they learned in a fairly compact uh, time. So, um, so kudos to you guys for creating something really, you know, really helpful, you know, really, really helpful and to the point. So thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, Kirstie and, and Chris, so you got the call to say, we're doing a movie, <laughs> we want to talk to you. Uh, first of all, uh, please correct me if, they, if I mispronounced um, the name of your tribe and, and how you, you know, um, 
how you present yourself, either one of you. Just uh, please feel, feel free to fill in any gaps on the bio information. We'll start with that. Kirsty, you go. <laughs> okay. Tu uh, hoi uh, is the pr pronunciation, um, but but you sounded a bit more melo melodic, so I might have to take on board your one. Um, gee, it's re uh, it's really good to see you, Helen Isaac. Uh, the last we were worried about what was happening in Utah with an earthquake or or something that happened there. Uh, so good to see you. Um, I. Uh, it was some time ago, but what I remember about these two was um, that I got a call um, from whoever it was, and and they said that there's these two Americans, and they've got no plan. And I'd had never heard that sentence before in my life. It immediately interested me, and I opened the door. Great. <laughs> That's great. Chris, how about you? <laughs> well, thank you very much for asking me on. And um, can I begin by uh, acknowledging Helen Isaac, who gave uh, Kirsty and me such a great break in uh, Utah? It seems a long time ago, pre COVID. And mm -hmm. I acknowledge Kirsty, even if she didn't acknowledge me. Uh, and I acknowledge there's a Margot Finlayson on the call. We're probably sort of <laughs> cousins, so nice to meet you, family member. Um, I was the um, Attorney General and the Minister of Treaty Negotiations for nine years, and basically the Minister of Treaty Negotiations is responsible for cleaning up the mess in New Zealand's past. <laughs> a lot of, there are the most fraudulent um, advertising campaign ever run in human history was one that said New Zealand 100% pure. And a lot of people may think that, but we're not. We're um, an extremely dirty country, and 5 million of us have managed to make um, a pretty bad mess of the place. And there's another myth that we live in racial harmony. Well, as Kirsty will tell you, uh, that is another myth. And it's a very serious myth that the veneer of civilization, as Mrs. Thatcher once said, is very thin. And in New Zealand, that is certainly the case with the way the indigenous people have been treated since 1840. And what we're trying to do is address those issues, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, and it was a real pleasure to, to work with um, Hal and Isaac. I should tell you, and this is shameless salesmanship, but... Uh, the book is finally out. Oh, hey. oh. You, uh, Chris, hold it up again. Uh, let us see it. It was it went up and back. So, oh, nice. Okay. It's a story <laughs> of uh, treaty settlements in New Zealand and uh, what are the, like, some of the sorts of things uh, we've wanted to address through treaty settlements. I should say, uh, to be perfectly honest, that we didn't start off because I'm not, I wasn't minister for the environment. We didn't start off by launching into uh, the rights of nature, but we started off from the point of view of that there are historical grievances which need to be settled, and how do we go about addressing them? And Kirsty will tell you there are about 65, 70 iwi or tribes in the country, but no tribe has suffered more as a result of European settlement of this country than the Tuhoi people. And I can go into that in greater detail if you wish. Uh, but what we tried to do was uh, see the world through Tuhoi eyes and reach a settlement with them that would be just and durable. And we should acknowledge Professor Christopher Stone, who was mentioned in the uh, documentary, he died a couple of months ago, uh, and it was his seminal work, coupled with some work that had been done in New Zealand many years ago, that really got the ball rolling on these issues. So it's great that the, the North Pacific folk uh, sent us some ideas 
We've played around with them and adapted them, thanks to Professor Stone. And now those same people are getting back um, Professor Stone's ideas from the South Pacific, uh, and we're starting to have a discussion across the ocean. So um, uh, I think that's a very positive development, and it's great to um, beam into California. This is the first time in 36 years that I haven't spent time in my favorite city, San Francisco, but that's simply the way of COVID. Hopefully uh, things will get back to normal next year. So that's enough from me. And I do apologize for the, uh, the salesmanship, but um, bad luck and the book is available uh, and um, uh, I will make sure Diana gets some copies. Well, 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 thank you so much. And listen, let's take it a step further. I want to invite you to put a link to where people can find this book yes. or buy it. I don't know if it's available uh, uh, stateside here, but feel free to put a link in so we can learn more. And I wanted to mention that too, Isaac, uh, to, for you to put a link into your site because you have some, you know, a really interesting perspective about why you do what you do. And um, so feel free to share about yourself. We'd like to soak up more uh, to get to know you a little bit more. So feel feel free throughout. How you wrote, wrote a book too, so <laughs> um, about Utah. Well, uh, I wanted to to follow up on that. Uh, Kirsty, uh, Chris was talking about the negotiations, and you know um, uh, that's a, there's a lot to negotiate, right? I mean, because when you look back in all that time. Uh, and coming from two such diverse perspectives, on, especially on land ownership, um, can you speak to the experience of being involved uh, with those negotiations? Um, were you uh, uh, satisfied with the results, if I may ask that? <laughs> I don't want to cause any world wars here, but you know, if you can just speak to, uh, to what that experience was like. Uh, it, it was certainly a journey, um, so uh, I, th I think it is a fair and balanced to say that Tuhoi would easily be picked as the iwi to be most indifferent, even confrontational with the Crown. Uh, that's not just as events and moments in time, uh, but Tuhoi would have a consistent 200-year uh, uh, legacy and history of that. Uh, un the underlying issue there is that Tuhoi have never accepted or uh, supported the idea of the Crown's ideas of success, of prosperity, of humanity, of relationship, uh, of um, community. Uh, that that the, the crown has always placed weight in a biased way on a certain select uh, body of those things. And, and so it's never really been personal. Uh, the negotiations was a six year process and um, I think uh, you on the issue of land ownership as an example, ownership is not an indigenous notion. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impossible thing to reconcile from a tūhoi, and I, and I uh, would uh, uh, suggest the indigenous view. Ownership is not possible uh, when that is based on something like property rights that that low that create su superior or inferior sets of rights and interests to people, um, to individuals, and so because people uh, in a two-way relationship with land is created through duty and obligations, through a history of giving and of taking from the land, that cannot be transferred or handed over or traded. Um, away and so property rights cannot do not they compete with the idea of uh, indigenous work and connection with the land and so that that makes the two hoi view in connection with 
uh, rights of nature problematic when, when the pursuit of those are for legal rights uh be, because the the kind the two hoi negotiations was more about needing to use legal rights to pause their application on the lifestyle of being two hoi uh within two hoi homelands um the negotiations though themselves confronted the issue of difference uh and the fact is, is that we all need to live together, work things out, and, and, and kind of share those sense of values, decision making, representation on issues. And New Zealand is uh, very new at, at that sharing aim. I'm, I'm curious, I'm going to bump this to a next question. Thank you, Kirsty, uh, uh, to uh, Hal, possibly Isaac as well, but um, did you develop strategies uh, that you learned in negotiating uh, that helped gain support, um, commitment or engagement in the movement? I'm wondering if you guys compared notes uh, about how you approached gaining rights of nature, um, you know, where you are in Utah, uh, Hal and Isaac, uh, versus what the way New Zealand approached it. Thank you. Well, um, you, you know, the, 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 hopefully this answers your question. I mean, when, when we first started the film, um, we had just gotten the news about the, the Ecuador she putting sent, or is sending you a book putting the rights of putting the rights of nature into its constitution and so we thought well we've got to go down there and get the story and being sort of the naive person I am I thought well they figured out a solution to all sorts of problems <laughs> and and we got there and it became really clear quickly that the idea was wonderful people loved the idea was widespread political support, but as you got saw from the film, there was no enforcement. And we came back, or at least I came back um, to the US thinking, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do with this film? Like the whole storyline that we had in mind isn't working. And a couple of months later, we heard the news out of New Zealand with Wanganui River. And then we thought we've got to go down there. Um, and that was a much more, in my view, a more positive story because it was actually working and happening. And then we came back to the US, um, wanted to get the Santa Monica story. Um, and of course here in Utah, you know, if we had more time and money, there are other places we would have liked to go as well, but you know, it's just how it is with, with any project. And so I think by the time the film was all done, I guess my conclusion was that uh, I think I wish I had Chris put it really eloquently a few minutes ago, but it, it, I guess when I started the film, I thought there was sort of this 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 new one size fits all solution, um, and quickly we realized that it's really more a question of the idea percolating through people's consciousness and every place figuring out a way that it's going to work best uh, work work best for them. So that for me, I think actually is the in my perspective, the most valuable piece of the film is that anyone anywhere could watch this film and think about how could we take this idea and 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 apply it where 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 we live. I'm glad to hear you say that because of course one of the things that we would like to do our chapter and moving forward with this work is to sort of galvanize the movement here in Southern California um, or all of California and. Um, um, we uh, have a guest on our call uh, tonight, uh, California State Senator Henry Stern, um, and oh. I'm going to, uh, to, to have Henry join us in the call just for a second here. Uh, he, uh, he has a, a young child, and so <laughs> we never know exactly. I'm um, circling back and forth, Diana. I'm going, I'm checking, but... Her, her mom is the most important person in the world. So mostly I'm just making sure. Okay, well, I'm her just- Her tea is hot, everything is good, and I'm learning a lot, so. 
I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you you are you know that we are a big fan uh, of the environmental work that you're doing for our state, uh, Senator Stern. And um, I thought you might particularly be interested in this conversation because of your past. You come from environmental law. I do. And um, uh, so, um, you know, after all this down the line, we are of course, are going to have a follow-up conversation with you about what can we do in our state. But for right now, um, I don't know if there are any specific questions that you might have for this esteemed group um, along the rights of nature movement. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I do. I, I actually do. I was I was really enjoying the the panel and and I'm excited to see the the film itself. Um, but without the, you know, just to sort of burrow into the the real sort of legal and moral issues that you all are wrestling with in all these different places, real places all over this planet. Um, and I, I, I say place purposefully because place matters and um, we lose place. The San Fernando Valley is an interesting place in that <laughs> way. And, you know, representing the valley and I, I don't know how many of your panelists have been out to the valley, but it's it was a valley, a real valley once with a river running through it and <laughs> floods and uh, tule grasses. And then it got converted into wheat fields and then the orange groves and Mulholland, you know, brought in the water and it out popped Los Angeles. And but it, in this new Los Angeles, we lose our sense of place. And I think there's something fundamental that you all are are pushing on that um, that is very threatened in a in a such a reluctant metropolis like ours because we are a biodiversity hotspot in Los Angeles. I chair the resources committee in the state of California. We look at I mean I deal with fire and oil and water and wildlife and extinction issues and endangered species and um, you know you don't think of LA as a place of of lions and migratory bird pathways. You think of it as cars and, you know, movie stars, um, but it's both. And can a, can a place remain wild and remember itself for what it once was and can maybe still be, and then still be a metropolis? And I don't think we've answered that question as Angelinos or San Fernando Valley residents yet. And so we've got some of these big questions we're gonna wrestle with, but one, one sort of specific project we're working on within the committee is in the midst of our drought, which I don't call a drought anymore. I, it's, it's the great right. drying. Right. It, there are no more droughts. It's just one big aridification event globally. And that's the right. tip of the spear for the entire climate crisis. And it'll drive mass resource conflicts. And we don't need to go too dark. But within this, within this tension point in California, uh, we started looking at water rights and trying to understand in the context of what we call public trust doctrine, right. which is sort of a cousin of rights of nature, that concept, right? That in the public trust doctrine, all this land and all these resources are sort of stewarded by government for the public trust. And so you do have standing in the state of California, for instance, against the government if it's misusing surface water resources or groundwater resources. There's standing in our judicial system as an individual on behalf of the people. This is not on behalf of nature now. The standing is on behalf of the people writ large. That's sort of the, the legal doctrine underlying that. But I think what we're, what we're disentangling further is before you, you start with the people's rights, you think I'm sitting on the ancestral lands of the Chumash people and this is, this land is now private property under US law. And you go back to McCulloch v. Maryland and you think of this country itself sort of canceling these natural rights that existed. And at some point there's a legal fiction we all created that we own these things. And so water and the, the ownership rights around water are actually one of the central tension points in our drought right now. And then the great drying that we'll see because people who took that water from other people hundreds of years ago, still hold those rights. And ought those rights hold water? That's a multi-billion dollar question that will kind of decide what happens in the future of water in California. And we're gonna be looking at it, but I, um, they say, you know, 
uh, what whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. That's a that's an old Western phrase. But I, I was curious um, if you've if you've seen those sort of water the water battle piece of that sort of play out um, and how it's affected sort about, of he's talking about you know long yeah, long standing yeah. water rights because yeah. um, anyway that our, that's what our committee is trying to to sort through and I wonder what other experiences you all have been through in your various places around who owns the water. I could start, I think that's a very good question, Senator, and we could talk after this at, at some length. I'm involved in a major piece of litigation at the moment for the major uh, tribe in the South Island of our country, where we've commenced proceedings against the government uh, saying that um, we have the right as a matter of ancient authority to do something about cleaning up water rights. It's been mischaracterized as a claim for Aboriginal title or customary title, but it's not a claim about property it's a, uh, or ownership of water. It's a claim about authority and the right and the responsibility of the indigenous people to step up and do something. So uh, a different nomenclature to what you have used in your uh, brief introduction, but um, exactly the same end to do something about addressing uh, the shocking state of uh, waterways in New Zealand as a result mainly of dairying and say in relation to the Canterbury Plains around Christchurch, which was the city so badly damaged in that earthquake about 10 years ago. Um, it, it should be the granary of New Zealand, but so much of it's been converted to dairying and the waterways and the subterranean water are very badly damaged. But I'd be very happy to uh, deal with you direct on some of those issues in, in, uh, the, uh, in the months ahead, because um, from what you have said, there's a lot that we could, uh, we could learn from you. Yay, this is what I was hoping for. <laughs> I told you, Diana, you have very, you, have, you keep very interesting <laughs> friends. I'm so, so thanks for dropping me in. Yes, you bet. You bet. Do you need to get back to your. No, uh, I want to listen more. I fall, pull the thread however it goes. If anyone else has a take from Idaho or Weber State, I know that uh, Professor Krimmel has written about. I did, I did a little homework before the panel. I know he's written about some of these issues too. So I, I was, I wanted it. I don't mean to call you out, but. Um, <laughs> I was curious, Professor. Oh, you can just call me Hal. I, okay. <laughs> um, all right. Call me uh, I, All right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a few years ago, I, I just, I guess like all of us, you know, you get concerned and, and wonder what, what is actually the status of water in Utah. And part of the um, in, impetus for me writing that was there was a lot of pressure to build more dams, which would dewater ah. more streams, which would dewater the Great Salt Lake, which is already at a historic low. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, it's sad to say, but then it was an edited collection. So I didn't, you know, it would have taken me five years to, to learn all, all the things that other people already knew. <laughs> but um, sadly, a lot of the predictions that were in the book. Um, have come true. And Isaac and I made a couple of films based on some of the ideas in the book. And, you know, I'm a transplant here. I've been here 21 years. Isaac's, Isaac, Isaac's a native, so he probably could speak a lot more about the, about the, the, the water uh, battles in, in Utah have a historical perspective, maybe some personal, personal experience with it. And I think, Kirsty, you're going to say something too. So. For Don't be shy. I'm so curious. Yeah. Um, Not normal. Uh, so, pardon? No, 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 no. I, I think it was. I think it was a Zoom paralysis. It wasn't shyness. Yeah. We were in a a blip in the broadband. No, I would be in the shy one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the two uh, experiences. So uh, we're we're an iwi that uh, comes from the largest native forest in the North Island of New Zealand. So I'm not the river people. 
I'm a lakes people. I'm a forest um, and, and lakes. So in respect to water, we, we strong, strongly um, uh, rebel really against the idea of ownership. As, as articulately as Chris has put that, using very intentionally uh, other, other words to mean a different connection, a different relationship. So um, uh, when you, uh, our difficulty, at, so if our starting point is this is our earth mother, just like uh, people wrote ring a ring a rosy and or Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, really to remind people about those behaviours, those incidences, a, a, a hum, human way to, to convey messages and lessons and learnings in the hope that future humanity is shaped by those events, by those lessons. So Indigenous people make up stories to say, the planet is our Earth Mother. That's not necessarily because we believe that's a human uh, personal feature, but how you and I respect our mum, uh, you know, what we would think because we know mum can read our thoughts, uh, the fact that stealing is bad because mum told us it was bad, uh, how, you, how you would, re you, you know, you're all by yourself, uh, you've, you've got an empty packet of something, you don't throw that away because it's your mum. And so that emotional connection, that body of respect that you, that you owe, our, our parents, that's how they tell us how to behave, is through those stories. Mm -hmm. So they say, see, this, this planet, this river, this hill, that's your mm -hmm. earth mother, that's my earth mother, that is how you are intended to behave. So when you invite ownership into, into any natural resource, you completely sever the emotional uh, respect, behavior, and you, it's, it's something us, only us humans can do, I think. We can literally turn that off, silence it, and not see it. And we, even though uh, we would act that way if our mum told us to in a discussion about water, Somehow we silence that and when we are talking rights and interests, the human gene called self-interest is more, is more uh, triumphant and powerful right at that moment than the humility side of ourselves. That, that is the real disadvantage about talking about own ownership when uh, we all know we need it to survive in the future but we're eyeing up the third house, okay, our self-interest in those profits. We, we just don't ever have, a, have an example in human history where hu that humility, that selflessness, that sharing gene has trumped that self-interest one. So we have to, but Chris uses different, different names, but, and Hal is saying start with the idea, but it is, it's a place to start with the idea so we can create another path and invite other judgments and other notions that balance and help discipline that self-interest thing that we've got. Muted, Senator. I was just saying how to tame ourselves and tame our arrogance. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the, 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 the loss of that intimacy that we have with our land when we fall out of rhythm with it and we forget that it's there and that we depend on it. And there's sort of a fear that drives it in that dominion theory that we have, that we conquer the land so we don't have to be afraid of it. Because mm -hmm. we're like, we turn on the air conditioning, go in the house, close the door. There's no more mm -hmm. nature, right? Like you live outside of nature. You live on the internet. We're on Zoom. Here we are. We're we're safe. There's no. Don't worry about the river. We're here. It's a myth we tell ourselves. I think out of some fear of wild things that comes from something primal to conquer all that. But we've gone so so far with with that myth. 
so far. And, and I wonder too, the, even the term rights of nature, I mean, that's not an indigenous term, is it? You're seeing it's, it's something, you know, non-indigenous people made up to, to perhaps find our way back to that relationship that you're talking about. Um, you know, to, to like find a way back to it. So um, I, I, I feel very aware of, of that, that it, it's a term that's helping us, you know, back. So um, Isaac, I don't know if you wanted to, to chime in on the- um, I, 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 uh, Christine, her comment, I, I, she said a couple words that just stuck out to me. One was this kind of a humility for nature. I, I, I have a client right now, it's a, um, it's the University of Utah Hospital, and, and I've been doing these videos for their eye center, and it, it's on research that different eye doctors do, but, but one assignment we're just chipping away at is that they want a one and a half to two minute short documentary on, on all 40 of their physicians. And, and so we just, we schedule these, we shoot a few at a time, and, and every physician has the same set of questions. And one question is, tell us what you do in your spare time. And we're all from Utah, so what do they do? They, they ski, they snowboard, they hike in the mountains, and, and that's it. They say, I love to go in the mountains. And, and yesterday we did an interview and the gentleman was a native Hawaiian. And his response was unique in that he was grateful for the mountains. He was grateful for the water. He had a relationship with it. And, and I, I thought that was just neat that other people, it, it was just, it was there. And it was kind of this privilege that I live so close to this, but this one gentleman who, who grew up with this, you know, in, in this condition Hawaiian, there, there was a, a gratitude for the nature. And, and that set his, just in his mind that, that, that made something that he needed to protect, that, that there was like it was his ancestor. So I, I think that's a thing we need to teach. It's, just, it's, it's a gratitude for, for, for these natural sources that we have. Just very briefly adding to that, um, we had the, uh, the writer Amitav Gosh here on campus for three days last week. Um, uh, he was really kind of a world famous writer. <laughs> and um, and he, he, the book we were talking about in my class was Gun Island, which has nothing to do with guns, but rather about that importance of storytelling as a way to help people understand the relationship to the past uh, and, and to nature. And I remember saying to the students that I think one of the challenges we face in, in, uh, in the mainstream society we live in is that we don't really have language that helps, that helps us express that aspect of our relationship and it's not really socially acceptable i mean you hear people all the time who are genuinely distraught when their dog dies i don't mean that in a in a facetious way they genuinely are but there are very few people who feel as distraught when when they see something destroyed in nature i mean there's some sort of maybe fleeting sort of gosh i wish those that open space wasn't full of houses now, but I feel like it's it's it's, uh, it's it's almost socially unacceptable to talk about that at that same emotional level of intensity. And um, I know some this is something I've been thinking about a lot the last year or so. Just how do we how do we find the language to tap into that very primal connection that I think has been sort of beaten out of us culturally. Well, and, and, you know, would we actually miss them if all the lions of Los Angeles died off? I mean, they, they're on track to in the next 15 years, right? There's an apex predator living in the Santa Monica Mountains in the metropolis of LA. But it's a, it's a really interesting question. And is it worth it? Like, is it worth trying to, not just for lions, for to have a habitat that can actually support that kind of ecosystem in a metropolis? that's really good land. You can build some really nice mansions. They are right now up Franklin Canyon and all these other places. And they're take, I mean, you know, it's Hollywood, right? But I guess, what do we, what would we lose? Would we notice or not? I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know what the, where the soul of this town is, but I feel like there's a, there's a, 
loud and very silent voice though that that does hurt when those things happen and maybe you just don't talk about it to your point how maybe you, you you don't mention it or it's a little bit embarrassing to indicate that kind of intimacy but i, I think it's there it's viscerally i don't know i'm curious from the audience or everyone else on the you know in your group diana like i, I don't know it's easy because when you're in your car driving around it's easy to block it all out but is it fully blocked or not is there a part of you dying too i don't know yeah, um, your comment that you began with, uh, place, and uh, that that your valley was uh, a biodiversity hotspot, and today we have to imagine that. Uh, here, uh, I'm a forest. I'm not a bush. I'm not a kind of landscape. I'm deep bush. Uh, in the middle of the day, and if you're in the middle of the bush, it's nighttime. Uh, there's no tracks. Uh, well, there are on the outskirts. Um, and so when uh, in early memories of, of two hoi kind of establishment, all of our language come from the, uh, that experience. Our idea of dark, for example, would be very different to Chris's in Auckland or Christchurch. Uh, the things that I uh, ate uh, coloured the attitude and the personality that is me. My idea of time is much, much different to my iwi uh, an hour away from me. I do long term. I think generationally. I get irritated by a one year, three year idea because in the bush, nothing of value is born or created within that nugget of a time. So, so all of us are shaped by our land, by our nature, by our, our environments. Today in New Zealand is 86% urban. The population of New Zealanders are 86% urban. 10 years ago, we would have been half that. We are changing in ways that are now so fast, our sense of our own personalities, our ideas, our purpose for being on this planet, our connections, our relationships are changing so fiercely uh, that we can't get to grip with our, with our own wants and needs, let alone the amount of difference we have to cope with around the table to pretend some sense of collective endeavor. It's pretense. All of our underlying, underlying foundations like tectonic plates, they are shifting and we're not, we're not even seeing them because we're too busy. Yes, our, our personalities are shaping um, not in a way that uh, I would call that comfortably. Um, uh, and we are struggling. One of the things I notice about us humans is we, know we, we, we no longer have the ability to forecast, foresee. We are living lives year to year. Uh, I don't think that makes us good people. It certainly puts us out of sync with nature that has these expansive time frame. Well, and ourselves, Diane. I mean, that's the interesting thing. When you when you when you force yourself to think like Kirsty's talking, do you the humility is actually quite comforting. There's a sense of security when you realize you're small. When I surf and I'm in that ocean and I feel tiny and I'm just like at that mercy, there's actually getting back to the mother analogy, right? If you can allow yourself to submit a bit to it, there is comfort in it. But I think, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, by losing step with nature, we lose step with ourselves. And then, you, I mean, I'm curious, like, what do you mean with the personalities, Kirsty? Like, what's happening to people? What do, you, what do you mean with all the people who have left, who've left the land and gone to cities? I mean, what do you see? Yeah. So if you imagine living in a forest, how much you need each other? 
Okay, so the thing about a forest is even though you might have the species of, so you, we have tōtara, kahikatea, we have all these different species of trees, yet not one of them are the same. So we, we were born staring at these trees, loving diversity. Well, we get around a boardroom table and we, we repel it. We've got no love <laughs> or, or affection or generosity for people anymore. It's my way or, the, or no way. Yet, yet nature didn't shape us that way. There's a, there's a hundred of those. Percy, can you, can you explain a little bit more what you mean by collective endeavor? Um, uh, what, how did I put that in a sentence? You know, um, someone asked if you could talk more about that. So why don't we just uh, wait until we open it up? In fact, this gives me a, a chance to do two things. I want to bring into the conversation uh, Marsha Mutri. I think Marsha knows Kirsty from a UN <laughs> event. And just to announce to everybody who Marsha is, she was the former city attorney of Santa Monica who uh, prepared the sustainability ordinance. So woohoo, uh, good job on that. Um, and uh, Marsha, do you wanna say anything about that or, or um, ask uh, our guests anything related to that or rights of nature? I do wanna say one thing about Santa Monica's ordinance which is, I did not prepare it. Many people prepared it. I was the last preparer. Uh -huh. So in some ways, I had the final say about it. Of course, the actual final say was the council's, but they chose not to change it. Um, so many people contributed to that effort. I also want to say, Hal and Isaac, I first saw your film about a year ago, and I, I liked it so much because it was very straightforward, I thought, and it was quite honest, I think. Very often with movements, there's an effort to sort of do a sales job of some kind, and you didn't. You didn't. I thought it was wonderful. And also, uh, Christopher and Senator Stern, it's just an honor to be here with you. It, but especially, Christy, it's so wonderful to see you. I was so lucky to meet you and your daughter. That was just a high point of that gathering for me. As to rights of nature, I'll say one thing. I think this is more about responsibilities than it is about rights. I think it's more about love than it is about law. Um, I think the Western concept of rights doesn't fit very well, if at all, with the concept of responsibility for nature because, though of course ownership entails responsibilities, but most people don't think of ownership that way. So um, I think the focus really should be on human responsibilities and stewardship and reciprocity with nature. Though I do a lot of rights of nature work still all the time with the Earth Law Center, but there are many many viewpoints in that worldwide movement. And I, I just want to push stewardship and reciprocity as my view. Harmony with nature as well. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I am actually just, uh, if I may, I'm going to just um, uh, remove spotlights. Uh, Senator Stern, would you like to stay in the group or would you like to? You are I'll hang out. Don't 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 defer to me. Keep going. Keep the flow going. It's, okay. Just well, throw me back in the room wherever I. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to change the chat back to everybody. We had uh, minimized it there for a minute so everybody could focus on just listening to the guests and not be distracted. Uh, so uh, the chat window is now open, and I would like to invite all of our. Um, participants on the call to go ahead and put a question in the chat, something you would like to uh, ask uh, one of our guests. So um, while they're doing that, I would just like to ask the question, how are the programs that you shepherded, how are they progressing today? Um, and, you know, part of that might be um, including whether or not they need enforcing or um, you know, are they doing the job that they were intended to do? I don't know, uh, Chris, as minister, do you, can you speak to that? Well, I left office because we were tossed out a couple of years ago. So <laughs> having been a humble servant of the people, I'm now a rapacious lawyer again. But <laughs> I do keep an eye on uh, these things because 
uh, it is going to take some time to see the Wanganui River settlement actually achieve its potential. And Kirsty can speak for Tuhoi, but there's still a prevailing view, isn't there, to uh, Kirsty in the Department of Conservation that um, they still have some say in the administration of Te Uruwera and they're wrong because the, <laughs> the framework has changed. The trouble with, I don't know whether the senator finds it with state government, but it's certainly the case with the, the Crown or the government in New Zealand is that the Crown has uh, very little institutional memory and they make promises and then five years later they've forgotten. So they occasionally need to be dragged to court to be reminded that the landscape has changed uh, and that uh, the promises they made uh, need to be kept. I think I saw a question that says, give us some good news. That's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> um, and Marsha, I think somehow you're even looking more feistier than, than you when I saw you all those years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there, okay, there is good news. I... Um, it's just not the tick box kind of good news. So uh, Chris mentioned uh, some bumps in our relationship with the government. I stopped listening to them about 12 months ago. Uh, so that's, Chris knows more about that maybe than me. Uh, so the two way attitude attitude is, which I think is also an indigenous one, is we, we actually don't have a fear for the planet. Uh, it's part of that humility uh, uh, aspect to it as well. So my, my mother is going to be fine. I'm fighting for, for, uh, for the, to deserve the opportunity to be a species on this planet. Right, so, so because I I don't um, I, I I don't have a doomsday kind of attitude towards this planet, but I do lament the way we are treating her because we that there is nothing deserved in there that is going to earn us the right to continue to inhabit this planet, and viruses, floods, uh, fires—they're all signs of uh, by the Earth Mother. Hey my species who I love and adore, please self-correct. Here, here, here are your warning signs. Um, so uh, the tuhoi plight is to sharpen up, is to sort, sort our shit out, not the planet. So if we can take, uh, if we can take, full responsibility for our duties, our obligations uh, that we owe uh, the planet, or te uruwera here, uh, the planet, then that is how we become deserving. Uh, and so the question then is, well, how are we going in our sharpening up exercise? How are we going in our ability to sort out our shit? because we have become highly addicted to all of those awesome Western traits. We've kind of fallen in love, you know, with big houses and unnecessary vehicles. Uh, so how are we going and weaning ourselves back off of the, those things to become more adoring of our relationship with nature? Um, and there is progress on that. It's tough and it's hard. Uh, and so, so for example, some of the fun conversations I, I have, uh, I get to have is when I'm looking at Tuhoi people who want to be paid, right? Uh, they want me to create jobs and wages for them to go and clean the river up. And I, and I said, well, no, no, I'm, I'm encouraging and growing kaitiaki, not contractors. How, how do I reignite your affection, your care, 
your responsibility in you that you feel more responsible for looking after that rather than me. Money is not going to. Money uh, is a disruptor of that sense of responsibility that you can take. So that's an example of weaning off things like the New Zealand government, who, um, who is not in the business uh, of restoring connectedness, restoring relationship. And, and so I don't know if that is good news, but we're growing in our confidence. Okay? Before we were very intimidated by the, the Department of Conservation, for example, they'd roll out their 10 scientists and I would look at my kaitiaki people who know more than Adam and Eve about that river. And I would, I would watch them cowtail to these 10 scientists that had, you know, hadn't even, didn't actually know where the river was. And I think that's an indigenous situation. And so through this kind of, uh, nobody owns the Uruwera, nobody owns this piece of the planet, that that is starting to seed confidence in the people in these communities uh, to reconnect to that responsibility. That seems right to me personally, to start from within, you know, and then allow that to reflect out. Um, um, we've invited some other questions. You pick that one up, Percy, and handle it beautifully there with the positive, different slant. Um, Hal, uh, someone uh, was asking earlier, um, just acknowledging that you were touching on the emotional grief aspect of nature, uh, the impact of, of the climate crisis on nature. Um, and uh, Chris Kevorkian, she is on our call and she works in that field. Um, Chris, do you, do you have a specific question that you would like to ask? And, and then uh, Hal, I'm also curious if you guys have that, um, that support uh, in, in the work that you guys have done, uh, a sort of a climate crisis grief counselor, if you will. Thanks, Diana. I didn't have any questions necessarily. I just think that everything that's being said just reminds me of the overwhelming sense of environmental grief that we do have collectively. But I think that what kirsty has been saying resonates so much with me just on the fact that at least in my work, when I'm working with people who are dealing with environmental grief, which is the grief reaction stemming from the environmental loss of ecosystems caused by natural or man-made events, I find that people often look at it from their perspective because it's, it's always got to be about us. It's always got to be about humans. Whereas from what I've learned from the documentary, from being in this rights of nature movement for the past six years, I am looking at the, my wild cousins, uh, my animal kin that I live with and think about how they are reacting to all the destruction that we are causing. Um, so it's not me, it's how can I support my animal kin, my wild cousins here um, as we're destroying their habitats and making sure that people keep that in mind. So I live in Washington state and when people are developing land here for residential communities, are you considering the trees and all the inhabitants of those trees when you're cutting them down? Are you looking at anybody other than yourselves? Um, and, and that's why I'm just so grateful to all the speakers because what you're saying just makes so much sense. And to me, rights of nature movement is like, not necessarily the solution, but it's definitely a help for those experiencing and reacting to environmental grief. So thank you. I see there are a lot of questions in the chat. I, I, I just wanna answer one really quickly. I'm glad I, I forget who, who mentioned it about the, the 30 by 30 and um, mm -hmm. Kirstie and, yep. Kirsty and Chris, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but it's the idea that here in the United States that we'd have by 2030, uh, make sure I got this right, by 2030, 
we'd have 30% of the land in the United States like set aside in some sort of conservation, easement, preservation, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, I, I think there's that sense now that hopefully it's widespread. Hopefully it's not just, a, you know, the proverbial uh, preaching to the choir, um, but, but that there are a lot of people concerned about this, that the catastrophic like fires in California, and even though we're, you know, 500 miles away here in Utah, at least in Northern Utah, you know, our, our valleys are filled with smoke in the summer from, from the California fires, from the Oregon fires, from the Idaho fires. And, and so um, I think even in such a conservative state as Utah, people are starting to get a little anxious, especially when they can see the reservoirs dropping Lake Powell, one of the major reservoirs you know, and in, in, on the Colorado system is like a historic low. It's not too far away from Deadpool, meaning they won't be able to make any power anymore out of Powell. Um, and so I personally am really excited about this 3030. And I hope, I really hope that it's not a fad. I think people are very prone to fads. I feel like I'm not, I'm a late adapter of absolutely everything. And I often kick myself for that, but I, I hope that there are enough people who feel that this is some that, that this all these pieces, whether they're local or whether they're more national or global, are are, are things that will hopefully have some legs. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that, and and then I see there's questions in there for Senator Stern and also for uh, uh, Chris. Um, yeah, Hell makes a very good point. It was brought home to me a couple of. Um, Years ago, Kirsty, I don't know whether it affected your side of the island, but after the Australian fires, there was smoke uh, throughout New Zealand, especially on the western seaboard, and that's 1,200 miles. So we're all interconnected, and 1,200 miles is nothing. Um, several people have asked me a couple of questions. First, um, are we? Um, I made some comments about New Zealand not being 100% pure or even 50% pure, um, is it any better in the United States? Well, I don't know that I can answer that, although I have quite a lot of comments to make about the United States government. Um, I, I, I think that the point I was trying to make is that uh, New Zealand does have that image and we've got serious environmental problems that need to be addressed. And uh, there are some very hard decisions that will need to be made about farming and we'll have to see how that plays out. The second point, I was, uh, second question that was asked to me, is it easier to pass laws in New Zealand than in the United States? Well, I think that the answer to that is yes. We are a unicameral system. We abolished our upper house many years ago and have never replaced it. Uh, we're not a federal system. We're a unitary system. Uh, our courts don't have the power to strike down legislation. So we, uh, the constitutional structures that we have are much simpler than a far more complex and a much larger country than the United States. And we're ability, we have an ability to effect change um, much quicker, I guess, in certain areas. Interesting. Um, you guys are doing a great, great job of fielding the questions. So feel free to pick one if you'd like to respond. Um, I would like to introduce the fourth question, which I brought up in, in a little bit in jest with Senator Sturm, but not really, um, which is that if we here in Southern California wanted to do more or to really try to get uh, some, the rights of nature, because it is a movement as Judy uh, talked about a brief history of rights, it takes time. You have to be patient if you're working with a movement, especially something uh, like this. Any suggestions, anything that you would suggest that would help um, build engagement, create a coalition? Um, what, what would you suggest from the experiences that you've had uh, that we might be able to learn from? I think Hal made a very good point about uh, it not being faddish. And the other thing so far as possible, um, and maybe this is a statement, and I apologize in advance if it sounds, it sounds to be supremely naive, because I know the political fissures in the United States at the moment. Um, but 
insofar as it's possible, um, try and not make it a sort of party political issue. Of course, it's a political issue, but avoiding the party political issue is important. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually not of the centre left, I was the centre right. Um, I'd be, in American terms, probably almost extinct. I'd be what you'd call a Massachusetts liberal Republican. <laughs> but um, I think it's very important to sort of try and get the other side engaged. Um, and uh, of course, in California, it doesn't matter because the Republicans don't matter. Uh, but in Utah, um, um, trying to get the Democrats engaged. So I think bipartisanship and focusing on the issue rather than party politics um, is, um, I think, a way that it will not be regarded as fattish or subject to the vicissitudes of biennial elections. But look, I can just imagine the um, the attitude that people have to those comments about what a naive fool this guy is. But anyway, I proffer those comments in good faith. Thank you, Chris, taken as such. Anybody else care to share some um, recommendations, guidance? Well, in, in, light of, in light of the proffering, um, I, 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 would say, I would say though, I mean, I, I represent some of the most conservative parts of California. Um, Ronald Reagan is buried in the, in the Simi Valley, right? The heartland of the Republican Party, the sort of ranch mystique uh, that uh, you know the country got enamored with back in the 80s. And so that maybe that's an anachronistic version of a Republican. But I actually, you know, what I've found is that in those communities that are closer to their land, if you if you if you don't use codes, if you don't just say like Al Gore says and then fill in the yeah. blank, you you can actually get somewhere when you're talking about hey, ranchers, shouldn't we be working on a conservation easement to make sure you can get more value out of that part of your property that's always flooding? And, you know, maybe we can restore that to some marshland and sustain your, your you know, whatever your operation is, or, or even, even just the, in the suburbs, right, of the San Fernando Valley, this, this group here, I mean, you, you think when you go deeper into Chatsworth and Porter Ranch and Santa Clarita Valley, those are areas that will vote conservatively maybe in an election, but they definitely want uh, the giant gas field behind their house shut down. They don't care about the gas company. Like they're not, they don't have some allegiance to pledge to the, to the gas company. They want their mountain back. Um, and they don't, so I don't know. It, depending on the circumstance, it can defy politics if we let it, to your point. It's, it's quite a good bludgeon as well. Right, but I think even this is a unique place to look at what the, the remaining conservative leaders are doing in office in California or in Los Angeles because they have to speak in a certain way. Um, and I don't know, especially here in LA, I think uh, maybe it affords some lessons that, that could be quietly transported elsewhere. If they're California eyes, it'll be irrelevant to the country. Because if we presume that we know best, when I worked on the Hill and tried to pass you know, federal climate legislation and we came, Barbara Boxer and Henry Waxman are here to tell you, Ohio, this is, you're gonna love this, didn't work. But if you, you know, walk very softly and, and, and seed some good infrastructure money to, to my point in the chat, I mean, the Great Outdoors Act passed under the Trump administration. I mean, that, that was one of the few pieces of major legislation that actually moved through the Congress. And that was national parks, outdoors. I mean, it was a meat compared to what the just passed through Congress last week, but it, was, it, it wasn't nothing. Um, so I think there is space to defy those tired old lines. And someone's just made the comment, look what Nixon passed, because of course it's a great start of a 10, who created the EPA, there who passed know. the Water Act, who plus passed the Clean Air Act. Um, it was President Nixon. Yeah, that's right. I, I want to just add really quickly, I, I think all the comments that everyone has made in the chat, I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to talk about all of them, but I, I really think that that piece about 
the language that is used is so important. And it's not just like English professor speaking, but in someone had just put in the chat about the cons conservation and, and conservatives. And in one of the, I think it was the water book or maybe the air quality book, I said, you know, that really conservatives need to think about putting the word conserve back into being a conservative. And those who identify as liberal also need to realize that we do have to use the earth resources. And, and I say that, I think, you know, when you talk to people, regardless of what side of the aisle they're from, they kind of want the same things. They want clean air, clean water, safe schools, <laughs> places for their kids to flourish. And, but it's often the language that gets in the way of it. And a number of you were using the word stewardship. That goes a long way in Utah. If you use the word environmental in Utah, there are a lot of people who uh, embrace that term, but there are a lot of people when they hear that term, they immediately, right. it's, it's lights out for them and they won't listen to anything more that you, that you have to say. And I think whoever was talking about the ranchers, um, Senator Stern, maybe that was you, I, I couldn't see on my screen. Um, exactly right. You know, I think, I think ranchers really want the same things that people who would identify as, uh, as, as environmentalists <laughs> do but it's a question of, of of finding words that don't make people feel they're being um i don't talk down to maybe uh if i can um add to the universe of ignorant advice um covid is an absolute opportunity uh, is the view of our iwi um, it is like a like any natural uh, disaster or event. It has it has a has a recycling um, effect. It it removes old in order that the new can grow. Um, all of our language to describe the way that we should be living our lives is now old and outdated. Um, generally invented in a time to, to champion exploitation. So one of the, one of the things uh, that could be done is champion a new language, displace old words, disrespect words, invent new ones. Okay, so your groups or your collectives, you could get together and decide and bring meaning to new words. And, and with, with that, let die in a kind way all of the prejudice, bias, and baggage that has built up around the other word. The reason uh, uh, also to, to, to take or, or experiment with that approach is that uh, we are seeing, likely to be the same elsewhere, we are seeing um, a very interesting generation grow up. Uh, it, like any new generation, they, they generally want to be the opposite of their parents. And it takes the grandchild generation to revert back uh, uh, to, uh, to the grandparent. So we're we're a little you know the thing about new generations they're irritating they're arrogant uh, they're learning and experimenting um, but uh, but that that's just the features of 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 learning but we but we are seeing people who who are admiring uh, you know the tiny house phenomenon um, in a in a way my generation never would. Uh, uh, they are admiring uh, things about uh, uh, clean water, whereas my generation wouldn't even know how, wouldn't even know the language to create that conversation. Um, so create new language for them. Play a longer game. Play with your babies. You know, um, uh, that, that's just things that we do. We, we kind of rule out all of the hard heads and kind of think that's, that, that the effort can, can be better placed with the babies. Uh, experiencing nature is a fun thing, joy, creating 
the memory and the experience and the touch of joy around rivers, lakes, trees, snails. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there are endless things um, that can be done. It's adjust your time frame if you're feeling under pressure. Uh, wake up tomorrow with three different ideas that you that that you know and just give them a go. Thank don't you. be too, yeah, don't be overly caught up in all of that government, state, politics, lawyers. They're the last people you need in order to do cool things. Okay. <laughs> okay. That sounds like good advice. Thank you very much. Um, just looking at the time, I know we've, we've gone a little bit over and I see the questions continue to come in. So um, I, uh, I, I, I know you guys in Utah, it's later than it is here for us. And uh, what is it, late afternoon in New Zealand at this point? So I don't know if you have time for a couple more questions or, or not, but uh, um, we certainly appreciate the time you spent with us tonight. So I, I, I see how rubbing its eyes. So thank you. So what do you think, guys? A few more questions would be fine. Okay, great, great, great. Um, uh, a question from Anton Antonina uh, and also from Ben Harris going back. Um, we have a Los Angeles River and um, some of us are trying to help make sure it includes some rights. Um, uh, Antonita, do you want to ask your question uh, live to them? Sure. Um, my question is, I actually live in Northern California now where I was born, but I lived um, in Los Angeles right under the Hollywood sign for many years and also in Santa Monica. and. Um, I love Los Angeles and, um, and, and, and I love the nature in Los Angeles. And, and um, when I lived there 20 years ago or 20, 30 to 20 years ago, um, there was really a emerging talk about the river. And I'm just, you know, so thrilled to see over time that, you know, so many things about the river have started to, um, unite people all along it. And I just love, I've always loved the notion of it because I always found LA being a place where um, people seek each other out and find things to work in common with, probably more uniquely than any place else I've ever been. And to me, the river is one of these things I, uh, and so I, I, I I used to teach at USC with the head of the landscape architecture school and she would take me to the river and show me places where she was showing her students how it could be brought back and listen to the frogs and say, you know, point out what things were, you know, choking the river and what things weren't. And it's just this, you know, this long kind of umbilical cord in LA that so many people turn their backs to, but, you know, and I think, okay, I see these, these places or a river or a mountain that are beloved that, that people get behind and, and find they can identify, oh, I could see giving that rights because it's, it's you know, maybe there's, there are ways of people to have an idea of something maybe they come to love because they participate in bringing it back to life that um, becomes a symbol of, you know, what can be. And I think the Senator responded <laughs> in, a, in a wonderful way. Somebody did. Yes. <laughs> that, was, that was me. Yes, I thought it was you. <laughs> We're doing it. We're funding it. It's happening. And it's not just going to be a river and reinvigorate nature. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to replenish LA's water supply. And we're going to we're going to restore the aquifers under Los Angeles, Wonderful. and actually re-engineer re nature for how it once was in mm -hmm. this town. Take the and concrete it out, over, <laughs> yeah. and it can get back to it. But we have to reclaim it, mm. and but hold those in public trust for all the people when we do it. 
Well, and that's, that that's the gives point. me goosebumps. That's the dream, and, I guess. And, and I think just to add one thing more, it was paved in fear, right? After you know a huge exactly. flood, and it's sort of that fear thing, like you know, why do we why do we fear nature? You know, have to bind it. So I I love that. Thank you, Antonina. And a, a question to follow up from uh, Ben Harris of LA Waterkeeper. Um, ben, if you don't mind, I'll just read your question quickly. It's the um, uh, conversation is about rights of nature. It seems more oriented towards protecting existing natural systems from further harm and degradation due to man-made activities. Is there a functional difference between that goal and using rights of nature to restore already degraded or developed systems like the LA River. In, in, the, in the way that you guys have used rights of nature, do you see a, a difference, a functional difference? Um, uh, no, uh, okay. both. Uh, okay. Because both are caused by human attitudes to land. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so for, for us, the, the, the piece of law that we used was to stop further degradation of that, stop further taking, mm -hmm. uh, stop the sense of non-accountability to, uh, to the impact that your choices were having on the land. Um, and then uh, what is the... Um, the premise of our approach is that the greatest pest and threat to our homelands are humans. So that's part of our falling out with the, with the Department of Conservation here is because in our pest, con pest control strategy, it's us. And, um, and finding ways to constrain uh, those, uh, those endless ones. That's our pest control strategy. That's our conservation management approach. And, and the view is if, if we can control that, uh, Mother Earth will bounce back faster than you can imagine. Um, I think we should probably um, go ahead and stop at this point, but I would like to offer each of you an opportunity to say a final thought, uh, I guess, if you, and that could either be to respond to a question or, or just uh, last thoughts and words um, for our conversation tonight. And, and I, again, I just wanna say how much we value the work you guys did um, to lead the way in, in the negotiations in New Zealand, uh, Hal and Isaac to produce a film that allowed us to see sort of behind the scenes of what happened and uh, how, and um, that was a lovely contribution. So thank you all for being part of that. And we will continue to talk about this and share the film and, uh, and uh, sort of keep this, keep this going. Um, well, thank you very much for your kind words, but it's not exactly true because we derive so much inspiration from um, your part of the world and Christopher Stone in particular. Uh, and so um, it's only fair and right that we should play our part in contributing to your thinking. So from, from, from my part, uh, I'm very happy to stay in touch with people and uh, answer any questions and uh, good luck to you. Great, thank you. And Chris, just a, a little note on, on Christopher Stone. I read that, uh, I think you mentioned that you were not actually part of the environmental um, group when you were in parliament, that that was separate? Um, yes, I was the minister for treaty negotiations. So I was trying to undo the mess that occurred after colonization. Got it. Uh, I wasn't minister for the environment. So I stumbled into this stuff from um, as attorney general and minister for treaty negotiations. Uh, so it didn't come to me as an environmental issue. Right. Well, it turns out Christopher Stone similarly didn't have a particular affinity for working in environmental law. He just happened to come up with this legal premise, uh, should a tree have standing, which then our Supreme Court Justice William Douglas took and, 
and, um, and, and it went off from there. But I did read that when he and his wife were expanding their house or adding an addition, they decided not to cut down a tree when they did the addition. And so a tree actually does have standing. And so <laughs> they kept it. And I thought it was interesting, which is a little bit sort of, you know, grow wherever you're planted, right? You know, I mean, that may not be what he started uh, to, um, to, to go after, and, but it certainly ended up impacting a lot of other people. So I, I appreciate your words in terms of that. The other point that I could just close on is that uh, when you're dealing with this issue, um, there is nothing new under the sun because there was a 1925 decision from the Privy Council, which was then the top court in the Commonwealth, uh, which held that a Hindu idol could be represented by a friend appointed by the court. And in 1991, the English Court of Appeal was prepared to grant standing to an Indian temple as a party competent to be represented before the court. So when you start talking to people who's, who may say to you, um, uh, you know, what have you been smoking or what planet are you on? What are you talking about? <laughs> when you go back to first principles and you say, well, actually, it's a well-established theory and corporate law provides a very good precedent for the way in which one can deal with this stuff, it does tend to defang people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Kirsty, anything you'd like to leave us with? Any thoughts? Um, I would encourage your relationships with your Indigenous people um, in your communities. Uh, can I just say very bluntly uh, about the state of Indigenous people? We're all broken, right? Uh, this is not uh, who we are or what we are. Colonization was a very successful thing and it hasn't ended. So the romance around indigenous people is, is, a, is, a, is something to be realized, to be regained and reclaimed in the future. The, the ideas around indigeneity are things that are not owned by indigenous people. So all of the things that you have that you may have cited that you respect and admire about the about the idea of indigenous people, they are not owned by indigenous people. We all need to grow our children to adore those same things. Indigeneity, uh, liberalism, those are human constructs, which in my opinion are no longer relevant. I feel uh, very privileged to be connected with all of you tonight, today, tonight. And it is, uh, I'm very, very grateful to be connected to see how and Isaac and Marsha again. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you for being part of it and for your words. Isaac? No, just, just first of all, thank you. And thanks for getting the four of us together again. It's fun to see these guys. And we appreciate you sharing the documentary and it's something that we enjoy doing so we, we're happy that it's getting out there and people are seeing it and I, I think I just just say what I said before just um, I think it's just we need gratitude for these creations that are around us and um, and going back to your if it's your river if it's your air your mountain um, just really being humbled that, that you have these things and, and these natural wonders to be around you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hal? Oh, shit. I feel like it's a lot of pressure to say something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, first, just thank you, Diana, for bringing us all together. And thanks to everyone who's still mm -hmm. here um, uh, on, a, on a Tuesday evening. And I am, I am just so glad to see Chris and Kirsty um, again. Again, it was just wonderful working with you. So good to see you up here in Utah a couple of years ago. And Isaac and I are going to get to work on our air quality film um, in the next few days. And um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that the film still is uh, relevant to people. That to me is really special. 
And yeah, yes. um, in a selfish way, I think just continuing this conversation has made me really think a lot about um, that hopefully we are able to continue to uh, find a way to open ourselves to the possibility of communion with, with non-human uh, life forms. And I mean, just the, the research say that's, that's gotten a lot of press in the last year about trees communicating with each other mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's so many things we don't know, languages we don't understand. And that has, has me very fascinated, but also sort of feeling like a avenue for, for being connected with the world beyond people, which I think is important, but it's also important to connect with people. Uh, it's been very uh, wonderful to be here with you all this evening. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you guys have given us a real uh, gift tonight um, and everything is from your heart and your experience. So it's given us an opportunity to take that in and, and see things differently. So um, I just thank you so much for being part of this. And hey, let's do it again in another six months. <laughs> Maybe we'll uh, be able to advance the conversation, but we sure would love to continue this conversation in some form, at least uh, stay in touch with you as, as we move forward. And uh, you never know, maybe there's a Rights of Nature movie too, you know, in your future and, <laughs> and we can help you. So <laughs> thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks to everyone on the call tonight uh, for hanging in there and uh, turn off your mics and give our guests a great round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this, being with us tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank and uh, thanks thank for all you. the work that you've done on the Rights of Nature.